Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I'm your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly webinar series where we cover a variety of topics that may be of interest to libraries. Uh, the show is broadcast live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time, but if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. We do record the show every week, and that is then posted onto our website, and I'll show you at the end of today's show where you can access all of our archives. Uh, both the live show and the recordings are free and open to anyone to watch, so please do share <laughs> with your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, anyone you think that may be interested in any of the topics we have on the show. For those of you not uh, from Nebraska, local here, uh, the Nebraska Library Commission is the state agency for libraries in Nebraska. Uh, in other states, sometimes it's just called the you know, state library, like New York State Library, where the Nebraska Library Commission. So we um, serve all types of libraries in the state. So you will find things on our show that are for publics, K-12, academic, uh, universities, colleges, um, museums, corrections, anything that has a library or is doing something library related, there could potentially be something on our show about it. Uh, we do, and we do a mixture of things here, interviews, um, demos of products and services, book reviews, mini training sessions sometimes. Um, we're pretty much all across the board. Really, our only criteria is that it's something library related, something libraries are doing, something we think libraries could or should be doing. <laughs> uh, cool things that libraries themselves are out there. Um, we bring in guest speakers from um, across Nebraska and actually across the country in to talk about what they're doing in their libraries and their organizations. Um, and we also have Nebraska Library Commission staff that sometimes do presentations about some things that are local to um, or doing offering here through the state, but some things that are broad and of use to anybody out there. And today we have our monthly, yes, we're still monthly, <laughs> we're keeping up with that, um, pretty sweet tech session on um, Encompass Live. Once a month, Amanda Sweet, Amanda, good morning, Amanda, um, comes and joins us. She is the technology innovation librarian here at the Nebraska Library Commission, and she does monthly episodes with us about um, anything tech related. So if you are a techie type person, or you want to know more about that kind of thing, this is definitely the that the, the one the monthly episode for you to be here for us. Generally we try and keep it where you're working on we're working on getting it to be every the last Wednesday of every month. Um, but sometimes due to scheduling um, things, sometimes it, it, it changes. Yeah. Like for example, this month she's on this week instead of next week because we have something else coming up next week for you. But that's okay. Just you know check out our schedule and see when she's on. Uh, and today she's going to be talking about solving real world problems with emerging tech, which is uh, which we hope that it'll solve all of our problems. <coughs> I can't make it. <laughs> yeah. a little too much pressure. No. Okay, sorry. No. <laughs> solving some of our problems. So yeah, yeah. 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 So tell us how it can do that. So that's kind of the quote unquote buzzword in the STEM field right now, mm -hmm. which is we're supposed to be reaching out to different communities and incorporating real world real world problems that people care about. So they can they can identify yeah. with what you're trying to teach them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I work primarily with adults and older teens. So in the case of adults, you have to really they have to really care mm -hmm. because it is hard to get adults to come into the library. We're not as much into just, oh, I'll just experiment and play with it. Yeah. It's yeah. more, what, what can this do for me? It's like, I Why have should to, I care? <laughs> yeah. It's like I have to take care of my kids at home and I have to be at work for 40 hours a week and you want me to build all these skills and you want me to learn all these new things. You better <laughs> give me a really good reason. <laughs> you know? So that has become our job, is to find what matters. So that's why in a lot of cases we start in, so my background is mostly in makerspaces, emerging technology, and incorporating technology into nonprofits. Mm -hmm. Like before I was in the library system, I was in a nonprofit called Beyond Vision. And in Beyond Vision, I had to adapt most of the technology solutions to be blind and visually impaired friendly. Mm -hmm. And that's actually where I picked up most of my tech skills. Cool. <laughs> So in this case, we're actually going to put the problem first. 
not the technology. No way. I know. So you should always do this. I know. And so many times we don't. I know it's a yeah. habit. It's it's a bad habit, yeah. but it's a habit you get into. So I want to I want to see how cool virtual reality is. Let me yeah. put on the headset. And that's kind of okay. That was fun. Now what? Yeah. It's yeah. a common problem that I see in a lot of maker spaces mm -hmm. right now. Oh yeah. Is we get the technology and then we try to find the problem. Mm -hmm. And it's because that technology is is popular. Mm -hmm. And I'll get a ton of emails asking, so what kind of robot should I buy? And what kind of technology should I buy? What kind of apps are popular? And then I'll always email at, back and say, what are you trying to accomplish? Mm -hmm. What That's problem not, are you solving? Yeah. And half the time I never get a response. They don't know. It's they haven't true. thought about that yeah. yet. Yeah. And this will help you respond. So we're going to use Stanford's design thinking methodology. So we're going to start with who is actually going to be using the technology? What are their needs? What's the actual problem that you're working with? What are the factors that are going into this problem? And dare I say it, we're going to go global. No. But not the way you think. <laughs> <laughs> and so steps two through five on this list here in here will just be an example of how to apply a real world problem to this design thinking methodology. And step number six will be examples of how to apply the same situation to other scenarios. Mm -hmm. And then this can be converted into a variety of different lesson plans based on different scenarios and choosing which problems are relevant to your community, which I personally can't tell you. you yeah, it's gonna, that a, lot, some, a lot of this is going to be specific to what your situation yeah. is. But you can use these skills and, yeah. and to figure that out. Yeah. Like if you email me tomorrow and say, which problem should I, should I be focusing on? I will ask you a lot of questions. <laughs> a lot. <laughs> You need to go out into your community and see what is the what are the yeah. what are your community's problems or what their interests are. It's not always yeah. a problem like something's wrong. It's like what are their interests sometimes. Pretty much. Yeah. And you can look at your community development plan and find yeah. out which problems are in there. What the city what your community is working on. Yeah. And that way you know what your stakeholders are interested in and what mm -hmm. you're more likely to get funding for in the library. Yep. So that is one of my favorite places to start is that community development plan. And so on the slide here, you see this design thinking phase. And it's in a circular arrow because you can revisit any one of these stages at any time. Mm -hmm. And there will be a handout that's available with this that will give more description about what each of these different stages are. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to spend a ton of time on it right now. But empathy, you find out more about your target mm -hmm. audience. Define, you find out what the actual problem is using information from the empathy stage. Mm -hmm. Ideate, you choose at least three different solution options that could work and solve the actual problem. And then prototype, you build one of the solutions or choose one of the solutions. And in the testing phase, you choose different criteria that will tell you this solution is working or it's not working or we need to tweak something. And then you also find out who's going to be responsible for the solution. In the case of a lesson plan, you would just have people walk through these different steps. And you would probably stop shortly after the ideate or after the prototype stage before mm -hmm. you sink a lot of money into it. Mm -hmm. Because you can learn a lot just from going through this planning phase and researching in the background information before you spend money. <laughs> yes. And since you mentioned there would be a handout with more details on that, I'll also yeah. mention because people do wonder, the, a link to the slides will be available as well. This is, yeah. um, Amanda has it set up in her Google Slides, so um, we'll have that um, for you um, and afterwards. Actually, what could be more helpful here is if I give it to you now. So this is, and I'll give you a shareable link so you can view it here. And I'll put that into the chat. So you know at the bottom is the chat one. Yeah. Thank Open you. it up. And 
set to an entire audience, you should be able to put the message and to type the message yet. And so you should have a link in the chat now if you want mm -hmm. it for reference. All right, so let me hop back in here. And we were on yeah. our goals. So a lot of times. So you just click on your slides, it'll. Perfect. There you go. Boom. So we're going to start here to start with the brainstorming process here because we're going to use local problems, we're going to use individual problems, and we're going to use digital community problems. But they all relate in some way, shape, or form to this goal. And if you haven't heard of it before, the Sustainable Development Goals, they were made by the United Nations, mm -hmm. and they were agreed upon in, I want to say 2015, 2016. And so if you're looking at community development plans that have been made within the last five or so years, and most, most strategic plans are five-year plans, mm -hmm. so odds are pretty good that the goals that are in your community development mesh with at least one of the goals on here you're going to recognize something. Yeah. yeah. And in this case, this is the point where we're going to go global. And we're going to do it right away because this is going to go into our planning stage. Because one of the most important parts about technology is finding out how it impacts people. Because if we're going to be choosing solutions that are based in emerging technology and based in technology that's still being developed, we need to know what it's going to do to people. We need to know what it does to us as an individual, what it does to us, the world as a systemic whole, what it, how it impacts our local community, and how it impacts the way people are communicating together. So these 17 different goals are admittedly a little idealistic, <laughs> just a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> They're a starting point. Yeah. So yeah. They're like, yeah. So the whole thing behind this is they want these to be accomplished by 2030. It's 2020 right now. Ten years. Yep. No poverty. Yeah. So no poverty, zero hunger, and it's a lot. Yeah. So, but as I said, ev you, everyone doesn't <coughs> have to do all of these. I mean, yeah. You yeah. may be in a, in a state to work on just one of them, like good health and yeah. well-being, and that's your focus, and that's okay. Yeah. You don't have to be responsible for all 17. And a lot of these are interrelated. It is true. Yeah. So this will help as a decent reference point because people only pay attention to what's relevant to them. And it makes sense. There's only so many things that you can actively care about and actively do. So this is where we start. And this is how we make sure that we're covering all of our bases. Mm -hmm. So let's just start with an example here. This is the problem that I've run into quite a few times. Uh, deep fakes. If you don't know about deep fakes, there's more information in the handout that's available. But if you've ever seen the video of um, Barack Obama saying just crazy off the wall things, mm -hmm. it was actually a deep fake. And it, it works through artificial intelligence. And you can take a whole bunch of sample photos and sample video footage off of the internet, and then you feed it into an algorithm. The way artificial intelligence works is mostly through training sets. So that artificial intelligence algorithm starts to learn the different facial movement patterns and how your body moves, how your face works, and it's able to replicate that using different faces. So you can overlay someone else's face, map those features over, and then the more data that algorithm has to train and learn from, the better the overall quality of the deep fake video is. So that's why you see more deep fake videos of celebrities, because we have more base footage. So many videos, yeah. But then think about social media too. How many mm -hmm. photos do you put of yourself and how many videos do you sure. put of yourself on, so, on social media? And then how can you use that in aggregate 
to train one of these deep fake algorithms to make a really realistic video of something that you would have never said. And that actually happened to people. Trust nothing. Yeah. <laughs> and that unfortunately. Yeah. Which is why you get the anxiety, fear and yep. confusion. So now we want to find out how this is what this is actually doing to people. And what can the library actually actively do? Because when you think about it, who's our target audience for helping with deep fakes and helping with fake news? Everybody. Mm. Everybody under the sun. Can libraries target everybody at once? Yeah. Can try. Yeah. 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 So depending on the resources available <coughs> and what else you're working on, you might want to leave K through 12 to local schools if you know they're already working on it. Mm. And then you might want to work on older adults and adults. Mm. But then people don't know what deepfakes are. So if you put out some sort of advertising saying, avoid deepfakes, they'll be like, I don't care. And what is, how, yeah. how, do, I, how do I do that? Yeah. Um. So you need to start embedding it into other programs that are already popular. So this is where the empathizing stage is. This is before you've even figured out the technology solution to this and what else is it's impacting. And this is where you start to find out other partner organizations within the community that might be able to help. This is where you start to go global. So you are we already know we're impacting education. All education across the board relies on the dissemination of accurate information. Deep fakes are a threat to that. Mm -hmm. Peace, justice, and strong institutions means that if you want to have people like the public place trust into the government and place trust into a library commission, deep fakes can threaten that. And this is kind of a touchy subject, but depending upon your personal beliefs, you might have seen that in the 2016 election. Mm -hmm. There were a lot of deep fakes of Hillary Clinton. And oh, the, yeah. Yeah. That people shared. Yeah. And it just, that, it was just, it threatened institutions that you would normally be able to trust and that you never would have questioned before. And now you question everything. So what are the government organizations within your community that want to protect themselves and protect the public? And how can you use this to leverage a partnership and to be able to get the information out there in other ways than just putting an advertisement on the library wall? Because how many people physically go into a library branch and look at the, at the poster board in the library? Mm. A bunch still, yeah. but it's, you reach more people if you partner. And then health and well-being, there is, it's the anxiety thing. People are stressed out mm -hmm. over this. So what about a local hospital or a mental health organization or a public outreach organization? And then responsible consumption and production. What about the technology companies that are putting this information out there? This is like Facebook and Twitter and the social media platforms, and especially Google. They're the ones that would could be in charge of flagging this and pulling this information down. But there was also a huge controversy about Facebook leaving all of that stuff up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and they weren't in things that they knew were fake. They were not going to be about that had to do yeah. with that were about politics, politicians. Yep. Yeah. And, and some of them, <coughs> some started flagging all of this information, but in the beginning, the flag was a tiny little thing, like a speck in the corner <laughs> that you wouldn't notice. Yeah. And people just glossed over it. So who are the actual players in this? If we go back to our scenario, we're starting to frame a real question here. Our original question is, how can libraries help? But now our question is adapting to who's actually playing a role in this. What is it impacting? And what's it doing? Mm -hmm. 
So this is where we start to define our problems. Why are deep fakes even out there? And what are they trying to accomplish? So when you look at the handout there, I've actually worked through a potential answer to that problem. And as you're referencing that handout in the future, these are just possible answers. This was my personal brainstorming that went through. You might come up with something completely different. Mm -hmm. And that's the beauty of the problem solving process. You might look at this whole outline, think of the, your individual community, and your answer is different. And that's what we want. So these are kind of the questions that we actually need to address and what our potential solutions need to address. And some of these are not going to be the same for every single, like in this particular question of deep fake, <laughs> it's not going to be the same. There's not one answer. It's yeah. Why yeah. they exist? Oh, well, some people are trying to make you think somebody said something. Yeah. Some people are just doing it for fun because they can. It yeah. has no real anything behind it. <laughs> you, yeah. know? you just, yeah. A lot of them are for entertainment. Yeah, that yeah sure. Just for fun. Yeah. Yep. And they are entertaining yeah. sometimes. As long as you know what you're watching. Yeah. You're aware of the fact that this person didn't really say these things. Yeah. yeah. And that's why I equated deep fakes with fake news in this case. Mm -hmm. Because if you look at the handout, in there's also a fake news section. And from Cornell University, they put together a how to identify fake news, impact of fake news. And those mm. same impacts and the same way you identify fake news is how you identify these. Mm -hmm. How you identify altered video content and questioning the context of where that video appears. And if you know that an election year was held in November, but the video was in a summer background. Yeah, things like that. You can, off. Yeah, <laughs> you can tell, yeah. But how do you get people to pay that much attention instead of just going for the flashy title? And then how do you know that the solution you're about to choose is working? And this is actually a little side step that you would probably do twice. You would make like a little mini criteria before you choose your solutions and then refine your criteria after you've found solutions. And what's my time here? Because I might not want to go through these. 1028. We okay. started a little late, so yeah. I'll probably go a little after 11 by the end. All right, okay, fine. <coughs> Our primary goal is to find out if the solutions we're about to research and review are solving these questions. And that's why we want to start quantifying these questions or giving more criteria based upon how people would behave if they were to actually be able to identify deep fakes. Mm -hmm. And how would we be able to test if they were able to successfully identify them? Um, there are quizzes online that should let you do that, but how do we get those quizzes in front of people? Mm -hmm. And how do we make sure that our solution that our intervention is actually working. Otherwise, we just shove more technology at people. <laughs> <laughs> Not the best way to go. <laughs> and so we might find the most amazing solution on the planet. Can we afford it? Mm -hmm. And if we were to do fundraising for a year, would we be able to sustain, sustain the solution in the long term if we did find it effective? And are we just solving little symptoms of a problem or are we actually attacking the root cause of a problem? Are we finding the cause of deep fakes and then also helping people with the negative impact of deep fakes? So now we're gonna start looking at solutions. And so if you look at this handout here, we have some options. <coughs> oh, that cold won't go away.
All right. Oh, I misspelled. No, oh, well, I'll fix it later. <laughs> it's Google. So now, as you're brainstorming different solutions, we have to start looking at what people are actually able to do. So I didn't specifically list out the different solutions down here because the solutions are actually available in the initial information. So when you review over mm -hmm. the deep fake videos are getting real and that's a problem, and can Facebook and Google detect and stop deep fakes? There are solutions pre presented in there. That's why I didn't list them out separately on the handout because I didn't want it to be a million pages long. <laughs> it's fine, you just link out to the right thing. Yeah. yeah. So these videos are maybe between five and 15 minutes long. And they will tell you more information about a challenge that Google put out in partnership with Microsoft and other organizations to provide data sets to different academic organizations and researchers to find better solutions to identify using AI to identify deepfakes. And then the article that says, can Facebook and Google detect and stop deep fakes? It gives information about, is using AI to fight AI really our best solution here? <laughs> you know? Seems to be, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and that's why a lot of people don't know about how AI actually works and how training mm. sets work and the different factors and weighted factors that these AI algorithms look at to make different decisions. And a good, like a really good lesson plan option that you have is to ask people how they identify fake news. Hmm. Just have people list it out. What are they already doing you know, that they think is working? And then have people compare notes. And then have people rank the importance of what they would look at first to identify this fake news and identify whether this is a deep fake. And then ask people, so if you were a technologist, how would you apply the, the importance to these different factors to an algorithm? And then have your entire group come together and compare their list. Did everyone organize everything in exactly the same way? Did everyone find the different... So I'm going to open this fake news infographic here. As a reference point. So this is kind of a... Is it a shocking headline? Is it outrageous? What's the date? And is the URL misspelled? <laughs> What's most important yeah. here? What are people looking at first? And what's not on this list that is more important for deepfakes? How do you apply this to media and videos? And once people compare their lists, they're probably going to start questioning whether AI can fight AI. Mm -hmm the kind of thing you need a real human to <coughs> evaluate it and think about, well, what am I reading here? Yeah. Yeah. And that's why the title of this is Solving Real World Problems with Emerging Tech. But you might also find out that technology isn't the solution. Mm -hmm. And in this case, it's probably a combination of the above. Mm -hmm. We probably want to put pressure on tech companies from the public to say, you need to flag this better or I'm not using your service. Yeah. And if people aren't going to use a popular social media service, we need alternatives to help people get connected. And I won't open the whole can of social media either because that's like a whole other thing. That's, yeah. But... So this is where we're starting to build our criteria of is this solution actually working? Do people have a great enough understanding of the emerging technology that is used in the solution to be able to know that this is the most effective solution? And this is also where you start to branch off into other problems that the library would want to solve. 
we need to tell people about deep fakes and how to identify fake news. People have higher anxiety and stress levels because of this. But a root cause of this is a misunderstanding about artificial intelligence. People don't tend to go into the library for for programs that are titled artificial intelligence because <laughs> artificial intelligence is it's threatening. It's, it's something and, people don't understand. So now we have two challenges here. We need to raise awareness about artificial intelligence and about deep fakes. But in order to do that, we need to gain a better understanding ourselves about what this stuff is. So then we start looking at the source. And so we look at, so Google actually had an AI ethics board that they recently disbanded over the past couple of years. Mm -hmm. And there was like a huge uproar about disbanding an ethics board, like an internal ethics board. Yeah, doesn't seem right. Right. But, so what are they doing instead? Um, we have sensors. So this, bear with me for a second because this is all related. <laughs> I trust you. <laughs> so the sensors in Google Nest devices, Google wrote a whole series of policies about this. And excuse the tangent because this is going to be re relevant later on, but these sensors are part of the Internet of Things. This is where we have physical devices that are talking to the internet. These sensors are gathering a whole ton of information and data about people. And this document is about the privacy policy that Google is putting into place to help protect the public, supposedly, from the, informa from the information that is collected and how Google is going to be able to use this information. Can we trust an internal Google document and trust that Google will actually adhere to their own regulation? Is there anyone out there outside of them regulating who should be yeah. or regulating this? Yeah. So on a federal level, that's not happening right now. But on state levels and local levels, it is. So Texas recently passed a law trying to ban deepfake. In order to ban deep fakes, they needed to dive into how AI actually worked. And this is where Internet of Things comes in, because all of this data is turning into, quote unquote, big data. This big data can be mm. fed into an AI algorithm. And then that, the more, the larger quantity of data that's available, the better that AI algorithm is going to be. And that's why the Internet of Things is deeply tied into AI. And then that leads into yet another problem. People are already using AI and already using Internet of Things, but they don't know what it is, why it is, and how it impacts them. So now we started with deep fakes. And we ended with artificial intelligence and the Internet of Things. <coughs> mm -hmm. So how do we make this relevant to people? <coughs> and you can actually branch this off into a whole bunch of different ways because this sensor data is also contributing to more fake news. It's an endless cycle, really. Mm -hmm. But, so I can go into the weeds on that example, but it's actually better for the world right now if I just go on to our next scenario. So we're just going to assume that we found the perfect criteria to choose a way to test if our solution is actually working. Are you going to go with this or are you going to yeah. pop over to the... So we're just assuming that we just brainstormed some solutions, we found our criteria, we ran through and talked to all of our partners and all the stakeholders, and we've appointed someone or a group of people that are going to be in charge of determining whether the solution is actually working. 
and now we're testing it. We've found out that we've watched those different videos and we found out that we need to encourage the public to put more pressure on tech companies in order to encourage them to make changes to their policy and adhere to those policies. We need to raise awareness about how to show people how to identify fake news and we have to build different toolkits that will show people what fake news is and why it matters. And then we need to embed those solutions into already existing programs within the library and the community so that there isn't just a digital literacy class that no one attends, in a nutshell. And then we move on to our next problem. <laughs> Trees. <laughs> we need more. Yes, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> so, a, in this example, a random local mountain community, their cliffside is eroding because they've lost a lot of their plants to deforestation, and it's the plants that are on the cliffside that are helping the soil stay in place to prevent the soil from eroding. Mm -hmm. And I apologize if I'm going complete left field <laughs> from fake news over into tree planning. No, it's just there's so many different things out there that, yeah. But if you look at that infographic for going global, it's across the board. So now the community wants to plant 50,000 trees, but they don't have the greatest budget and they don't have a ton of volunteers and they can't pay a whole bunch of people to plant these trees. And people don't care a whole ton. Stakeholders, they care a lot. The general public, maybe not so much. So now we need to start going through our process. So you'll note that I skipped straight over to the brainstorming process here. And that's because this is an example of how the lesson plans would actually work. So you would run through these different steps on your own. You start empathizing and defining. But when I tried to run through this project previously, people had a lot of problems with the ID8 stage. Hmm. Because how do you choose a solution if you don't know the technology exists? True, what's out there, and, yeah. And that's why in the lesson plan prompts, I give a scenario, I give the an empty blank for empathy and define and I give prompt questions in the empathy and define to get people started thinking about their target audience and framing a problem. But then on the ID8 section I give a cheat sheet. And this is your cheat sheet. <coughs> so these are all links to either articles or to YouTube videos about the different technology that exists. And I'll go into this tree planting drone. And we'll just show this here. Each year, there's about 15 million acres of forest that are turned into wood products. There's been 300 million acres that have been deforested since the 1990s. That same 300 million acres at current planting rates cost $100 billion to replant. The reason that we started this business is to make a dent in carbon emissions. And trees are, in a way, our best source to do that. There are no machines currently that humans have that can do that better and more efficiently. We think that robotics is a way to make reforestation truly scalable. Our end objective is using drones to plant tree seeds. We are paid per acre to plant tree seeds spray to protect them, and then monitor their growth. This is a big drone. And it's all a big boy. So we have one drone, eight feet right here, a uh, three gallon payload. Imagine 15 of those on this road right here. That's how we see that able to address a large forestry unit, both for spraying as well as planting in the future. It's a high power paintball gun, essentially. Pressure, <laughs> air pressure pneumatics, fire tree seed capsules to the ground. Right now, forestry companies, they spend millions of crew labor to go out there and plant trees. Good tree planter can replant somewhere between 800 trees a day, which is about two acres. One person 
with 15 drones can be the equivalent of 360 manual labor hours of tree planting or spraying in a day. We need a seed, so there's no nursery, there's no need for a refrigerated supply chain, and it's not an issue for us to put 80 to 200 different species into the hopper and then spray them all over the ground. It is a step function, it's disruptive technology. We are already in beta as far as a software platform that allows one operator to manage 15 drones simultaneously. And then that takes us into a whole game changer as far as the economics of reforestation, which is what we're super excited about. Drone Seed is the most important company working today in carbon sequestration through forestry. Do you believe that, that CO2 is changing the global climate? If you do, then carbon sequestration has to be a part of the global climate solution. If you have an automation company that makes it orders of magnitude less expensive to plant and grow trees, that's going to be part of the global carbon sequestration solution. It has to be. So that's, I think, the, the big idea for drone sheets. Could they be a foundational player in driving down the cost of stable climate? Replanting 300 million acres that's been deforested since 1990, that is a major step forward in reducing carbon emissions. What you can envision for the future is that one operator managing 15 drones, replanting post-wildfire or taken globally, there's been a lot of splash and burn agriculture. So how do you then go out and replant those in a cost-effective way? And that's where our technology comes in. At Drone we're trying not to lose the forest for the trees. Technically, like, I have that time on this planet, and I want to work on a problem that's worth solving. And to me, it absolutely makes sense to go out there and focus on the biggest thing that's threatening humanity. If the environment is not working, no social, political, or economic system is working. So that's why it's so important to get in there and plan it. That's very cool. I like it. <laughs> Close that here. <coughs> so then after watching that, you start going back through the process. This is your original problem that was presented to you. And now you start to empathize. Who is this going to impact? Who are your stakeholders? According to that video, probably the world. But in the case of your <laughs> library, the community. And well, on this one, it's a local thing. That, that, I mean, your local mountainside is eroding. That's definitely yeah. going to have a local impact. Yeah. I mean, in general, CO2 levels across the whole world are um, having issues. But this has got a local aspect to it that yeah. directly impacts the people and in your community. I had a choice between two videos that I really liked about tree planting drones. One was that one that I chose, and the other one was a drone planting company that was working in Myanmar. Hmm. And they were both amazing videos. I liked mm -hmm. them both. But when I played the Myanmar one before, people immediately said, why do I care? That's not where I live. Yeah. Yeah. I can't impact Myanmar. I it barely know where it me. is. Yeah. Yeah. So what we want to help people do is to find out that these global solutions, the things that are solving problems in Myanmar also solve really problems in can, Colorado. Yeah. Really can have yeah. an effect on you. Yeah. And the things that are solving problems in Colorado all problems in Myanmar, in different places in Africa. So I thought we can go global. Mm -hmm. And we kind of already did. Mm -hmm. And if you think about the, di the different digital communities that we're using to learn all of this technology stuff, people from all around the world are going through those communities. And when you go, so I take a whole bunch of classes through like Future Learn and edX, and mm -hmm. this is where I learn all my tech stuff that I'm kind of interested in, kind of really interested <laughs> in. <laughs> so I learn my Internet of Things and my AI stuff from those classes. When you go through those discussion boards, you get people from all over the place. And when the instructor asks you to give examples from your local community as to how you would be interested in using this technology, you get stuff across the board. 
And it's fascinating because you get some one person talking about how artificial intelligence is impacting the local justice community and how you shouldn't be using artificial intelligence to <coughs> make like socially based decisions, like really human centered decisions. Mm -hmm. And then you get someone talking about that in, um, I'm from Wisconsin, so that was the one that jumped out to me. <laughs> they were using that in Wisconsin. But then they also started talking about it in Africa. And then they started talking about it in the UK. And they started saying, yeah, this is actually impacting everybody. And it's just, you don't think about it. Mm -hmm. Like, I never thought about it. Because Until I someone just, puts it out there and shows, look, same thing happening in all yeah. different, yeah. So, once you play this video, play the Myanmar one. Yeah. Go start local and then go global. And then start encouraging people to look at different areas. <coughs> and then a drone is not the only solution to this problem. There's also this awesome looking robot. So I'll actually open it because it's kind of cool looking. But these are actually two university students. And I do not endorse this, but they actually temporarily dropped out to go build this robot. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure they actually went back and finished their degree, but they were so enthusiastic about this and uh -huh. solving this problem that they just went pell-mell. And, you know. and I don't know if I have time to play this whole thing because it's 10.52, yeah. but I'll just shift to the part of where it's actually working. That's pretty cool, though. That's the so this drone uses like a high-powered shoot technology mm -hmm. that shoots a pod out into the ground every six seconds, and it uses like paintball mechanism, mm -hmm. which is kind of cool. But this one actually uses like a little shoot and scoop thing, mm -hmm. and it has like a sapling. Yeah, yeah, and it has like the equivalent of a massive backpack that holds ten saplings. And then it's able to grab one, shoot one in, mm -hmm. and then it goes to like an automated distance or it, and it can sense its surroundings mm -hmm. to, plant the next, to plant the next tree. So then you start asking people to compare the pros and cons between using a drone and using a robot. Mm -hmm. Because you'll notice that in our scenario, it says that we have rough terrain. Mm -hmm. and it's hard for people to get up there yeah. to do it by hand. So Especially on the side of a mountain, I can see that, yeah. Yeah. And can a drone access those same areas? And can a robot access the same areas as a drone? Mm -hmm. And the drone will do an aerial mapping system before it starts doing any of the planting to make sure that it's able to work in that area and make sure the soil conditions are okay. But then once you've had all this stuff planted, you want to be able to ensure that your plant survives. So you want to actually brainstorm technology solutions that take the planting and growing process from start to finish. Mm -hmm. This gets them in the ground, but monitoring soil conditions using an Internet of Things system, that keeps them living. But then you can also bounce back to drones again if you need to provide additional nutrients or deliver mulch to the system. Mm -hmm. And that's where you get the future of farming. Because this one... Is actually kind of an awesome video. 
and hey, show me and I've got the Orpheum again. Coming again, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> A little ad. <laughs> but this one. And I don't have time to play this whole video, okay. but it is worth watching. Um, the one I'm looking for. This is the examination of the agricultural innovations coming down the pipeline that will help get us there. The industry has undergone major developments over the last century. 100 years ago, farming looked like this. Today, it looks here. Where was this new tsunami of data? And the farmer's business network combined data from many farms into one giant pool to give its members the power of macro level insights that have traditionally only been available to corporate mega farms. So that gives an idea of how they're using Internet of Things and big data in farming. Mm. So you'd be able to leverage the information that has already been collected about the growing conditions that make these plants work and grow effectively and then apply it to your own solution. And you'd be able to pull information regionally to find out the best growing conditions for the type of plant that you have. Yeah. And then you would be able to automate the process of once you find out the best conditions and your IOT devices on the ground tell you what's happening, it shoots it over to an app on your phone or computer, and then you can program a drone that will go, de go deliver those nutrients. Whatever it is they're needing yep, at the time. And then this also, this video goes over, like, the future of farming goes over a ton of different solutions that you can possibly use, too. And so this is just getting these ideas and information in front of people is what we want. Mm -hmm. We don't need to spend money on it. We need to get the information in front of people. <coughs> and if you happen to want to buy a drone, cool. <laughs> I don't want to even know the cost of those giant ones that they're using. Oh, my God, they're <laughs> ridiculous. <laughs> and so then we can go over a related issue, mm -hmm. livestock monitoring. And I'm very, that's something very identifiable here in Nebraska, definitely. Yeah. And it's kind of like this, the technology that is available for livestock monitoring is also available for cats and dogs. Ooh. So if you want to be able to find out if your animal has a cold or if they are eating enough or if they are moving around enough, if they're active enough, then there are different sensor devices that are rigged up through the Internet of Things that will let you know all this information without you having to travel all the way to the location of the animal to check it manually. Hmm. And a lot of these actually appear as little collars that go around the cow's neck. Yeah. And these collars have been around for a while, but now because we have more data that has been fed into the system, the technology actually works better. Sure. Because in some cases, more technology, more data can harm us because these different artificial intelligence solutions can work better, they can target us better, and they know more information about us. But in this case, more data is actually a good thing because the more we know about the health information and the more we know about what has the conditions that have worked for other animals in similar conditions, the better chance we have of keeping our animals safe. <coughs> and precision dairy is a good one to look at for this one. And the sensor system is a good one to look at because it will also show you direct screenshots of the app that's actually used mm -hmm. and the graph that is produced from the data. And it'll give you an idea of how you'll be able to collect that information, then that what you would need to learn to be able to analyze and use the information. Because having mm -hmm. the info is only half the battle. Mm -hmm. You still have to be able to tell the system 
the criteria to look for before you take action and the criteria to look for before you give an alert saying that danger, danger, Will Riker, you need to go save a cow. <laughs> And in a lot of cases, these companies will be able to give you a lot of, like, a really good head start on this, be using that aggregate information they've already collected. But it still helps if you know, if you have an understanding of the product and an understanding of the technology to know that what they're selling you is actually real. And kind of a good example, and I... I try to avoid bouncing back and forth between different scenarios, but I just thought of this. In this tree planting thing, um, I read the Arbor Day Foundation's recommendation for tree planting, and there was a recommendation that you should not use mechanical augers to dig holes in clay-infused soil because it would create planes in the soil and the root structure wouldn't be able to grow outward. Ah. So are the drones actually able to identify that there are clay deposits in the soil so that you would be able to make a decision about which technology to which use? Which would be best depending on where you're planting, yeah. yeah. So you would also want to look at a bit of background information or consult an expert about tree planting so that you know that you're not getting to make the right choice, yeah. yeah. And... I think I may have added an Arbor Day link over into there, but if I didn't, it's there. <laughs> so it's just those random little things that are the deeper understanding you have of the problem, the deeper understanding you have of what it impacts, and mm -hmm. the deeper understanding you have of the technology itself, the better solution you're going to choose, the more, and the better the library is going to look to. Mm -hmm. Because now the library is going to be a gathering place for people to make to brainstorm these solutions, and then the library can provide the necessary information to make sure you're making the right decision, so they can make the informed decisions. <coughs> yeah. I think that's that's the thing that I was trying to think. Of how, how does the library fit in here? Is like we know the library, the library staff know how to find out that kind of information, yeah. to know you know where to go to look. Now it'd be up to the expert on livestock or the expert on or a, trying to be expert on tree planting yeah. to decide to look at that information, but that's what we can help them is finding what they need to make these decisions about which technology to use to solve the problem that they have. Yeah. And this, so in this process of raising awareness about all this technology and helping people work through solutions, we're also helping people create new need, like technology needs within the community. Mm -hmm. And since we're helping create the need, we can also adjust our own collection development policies sure. so that we know how to meet the need we just created. It's kind of trippy. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's a cyclical thing. Yeah. yeah. You, you bring yeah. them in to try and help them solve their problem, and you realize, well, now we need more resources on this particular issue because it's yeah. obviously something you're looking at, what you said, the community plan, the, the community the, development plan. Community development plan. Yeah. Um, and the strategic guide, like strategic plan from as many different major organizations within your community mm -hmm. as possible. Yep. Because then you're targeting the active members and then finding ways to reach the less active members. Mm -hmm. And trying to also reach people on an individual level to find out what they actually care about. And if you find enough people on an individual level that care about the same or similar things, then you can also get them together to create a new need. Mm hmm and <coughs> this is also a major one. Smart city. So this is also heavily reliant upon the Internet of Things and artificial intelligence. And it's basically reliant on having different devices that you're able to communicate with remotely using like a, an app or some sort of device. So one of the most common examples is um, smart parking meters. Hmm. So that you'd be able to open up an app and you'd be able to find parking downtown instead of circling round and round and round and round and round and round <laughs> trying to find somewhere to park. You can see where there's an open spot. Yeah. yeah. And then you'd also be able to pay your parking through the app. Mm -hmm. And I know we have that yeah. here in Lincoln, yeah. but not. I don't know. I don't think we have the where is a spot. Not the aspect of it, yeah, you know? yeah. 
And so this is, there's a million and one different smart city options out here. Yeah. Uh, Microsoft is one of the major leaders that are providing smart city solutions. So I use that as an example of helping people brainstorm what's possible. And then the city of the future, the Singapore one from National Geographic is about an hour long video of like hyper future tech that it may not be something that people are interested in right now, but one of the major downfalls of smart city planning has been that they haven't scaled well. Mm -hmm. They kind of chose cost effective solutions, but they didn't really look at how all the things would mesh together and what they would want to do in the future. And then they find out that the solution network that they chose, either that network is no longer going to be supported because the company went under, or because it's not compatible with the other solutions that they're looking for. And so that's where that future planning comes in. If you're going to invest in smart city technology, go big or go home. And San Diego Smart City gives a bunch of examples about existing current technology that could be implemented right now. And then this city lab goes into some of the pros and cons to designing and building a smart city. So these are some different resources to give people of all ages a head start of what in the world they're looking at. And then you would run through that, um, define the pro, like, find out who's going to be impacted by it, then define the problem, and then you get your head start on the brainstorming solution process, and then figure out what it would mean and what it would look like if the solution is actually working. <coughs> so after this session, um, I'll also make available the planning lesson plan worksheet that I use for this di these different scenarios. And this will be a blank worksheet and then an example sheet of what a completed process would look like. And I can make that available probably either by the end of the day or end of tomorrow. Cool. We'll have that in our links with our archive. Cool. We do our archive up. But that is about the long and the short of it. All right. <coughs> All right. Get a drink. Yeah, <laughs> <pretty> <laughs> much, you know? Does anybody ha have any questions for Amanda right now? Um, nobody typed in anything while you're talking, but mm -hmm. that's okay. There's a lot of cool, good information there. A lot of things to absorb, I think, about technology that's out there. Lots of um, resources. If you do have any questions or comments. Um, oh, okay, yes. Um, about the presentation, uh, you can uh, type it in now, or we are a little after 11 o'clock, so I think we might try and wrap up a bit. You can always contact Amanda here at the Library Commission, of course. It's true. Yeah. So um, that was great. I, you know, these are definitely some really concrete things that libraries and people can do with um, technology. And I think the process of don't put the technology before the problem. The thing that we talked about very in the beginning is so important. It's a and it's a hard thing to uh, get out of that habit. The cool new thing is coming out, the cool technology, the um, everyone's talking about robots or 3D printing or whatever it is they're talking about. And so we should have one because everyone's asking for it. But why are they asking for yeah. it? You need to back up and put the brakes on things a little bit and yeah. do some more of this evaluating and, and the process that of, that you put into here for us. So, And it is a bit different for kids than adults because mm -hmm. kids will play with anything oh, you want yeah. to or put in front of them. And that <laughs> is interesting. But and they'll figure out ways to do it, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So let's switch over to here. Where are we at? Do we... All right, and uh, you shared another link with people. The Oh, the slide. Yeah, I just gave the slide. Yeah, the slide link, too. Okay, so you yeah. got those links right away. Yeah. Um, they'll also end up on our um, archive page afterwards as well. If you don't grab them from within the interface right uh, the uh, go to webinar interface right now, it's okay. Don't panic. Um, we'll have that later when we do the archives. So um, let's do, I'm going to have you type in Encompass Live. And we're going to go to our website. 
So, so far, and I'll say it before you, <coughs> yeah, so far, Encompass Live is the only thing called that on the internet. Yay. So, <laughs> um, if you use your search engine of choice, you can get to our website here. And we have our upcoming shows, but I wanted to show you first where our archives are. Today's show is being recorded and we posted right here in our archives, hopefully by the end of the day today, as, as long as um, go to webinar and YouTube, cooperate with me. Uh, it'll be the one at the top of the list here, and we will have um, a link to the recording in our YouTube channel, the Library Commission's YouTube channel, a link to the presentation slides, a link to the handout um, that I made up up there. What's the other thing you were going to... Oh, the lesson plan. The lesson plan. Yep. yep. We'll get that up there, too. So um, that will be here. Everyone who attended this morning and who um, registered for today's show will get an email from me letting you know when the recording is ready. Uh, and we also push it on our various social media, uh, Twitter, Facebook, our mailing list here in Nebraska. Uh, while we're here on the archive page, I want to show you, um, talk about our archives here. You can see we have a search feature here where you can search the entire archives or just the most recent 12 months. <coughs> that is because this is the entire archives for the history of the show. Encompass Live premiered in January 2009, and we have all of our recordings on here. So um, if you're searching the entire archives, just pay attention to the date when something was originally broadcast. The, um, the, some things will stand the test of time, and some things may not. <laughs> there may be services that don't exist anymore, programs that have changed completely, links that are broken, um, but just pay attention. But we are librarians. This is what we do sometimes part of our job. We archive and, and histor keep things for histor historical purposes. So our full archives will always be there. Um, just pay attention when you are searching that you pay attention to the date, or if you just want something current, limit your search just the most recent year, and you'll only find things that are just within the last 12 months. Um, but we do have a Facebook page for Encompass Live as well, so if you do like to use Facebook, give us a like over there. There's a reminder to join us for today's show on the fly um, when our recordings are available. No, I don't want to log in. Um, when our recordings are available, we post on here. Um, Reminders of upcoming shows, anything else going on that's related, uh, you will post over there on our Facebook page. So that's all for today's show. I hope you join us next week when our topic is community engagement, which is kind of related to what you were talking yeah, about, yeah. getting out into your community. See, uh, community engagement, straight, straight talk. Uh, Erica Rose is from in our um, library science program here at, well, here, University of Nebraska at Omaha, <laughs> and she's a faculty there, and she'll be talking to us about community engagement next week. So if you're interested in trying to see how you can get out into your community and work with them and find out what's going on, this is definitely um, a rec highly recommended show. And you see of our upcoming shows for February all listed. Next time Amanda will be with us, we'll be on, we are now on to the last Wednesday of the month, <laughs> February 26th, topic to be determined. I'm thinking chatbots. I don't think mm -hmm. I did that chat one. Chatbots, yeah. I think yeah. you did blog posting about that, but not a session here. Yeah. yeah. So maybe chatbots. We'll get a full <laughs> description up there um, soon. And I am working on dates in you know, March and April as well. So as I get those finalized and confirmed, you'll get they'll up, be up here on our website. So please do sign up, register for any of our upcoming shows. Other than that, thank you so much, Amanda, for telling us all about technology and the right way to use it to solve our problem. Hopefully. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and thank you everyone for attending and hopefully we'll see you uh, another time on Encompass Live. Bye-bye.